Welcome back to this week's second episode, where I talk to Dov Savatskis from Expedia in the UK about how he got into sourcing, how to spot a bad workplace for a sourcer, and how going to SourceCon meetups helped his career. This is the Sourcing Challenge Show, and I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. I started off by asking Dov how he got into sourcing. Wow, <laughs> where do I begin? I mean, in general, I started sourcing in 2014, but my first uh, kind of take on recruitment and in in about HR in general was back in 2006 when I was still based in Lithuania and I was part of like international company Transcom worldwide and it was a, a big basically operation call center for the outsource uh, clients from UK um, states and all over the place uh, and I was a team leader and then my company the, the company that I was um, supporting got acquired and I basically was in, in, in the mix of losing my job and I knew that there was no team leader role anymore in the company. And then the HR manager, she was like, would you like to try to be an HR assistant? I was like, of course, because I was, you know, since, since the age of like 10, 12, I remember reading psychology books and about the behavior and you know, all of that, like it, it always interested me. And, uh, but I never went to study that at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of first take on that. I was doing payroll, recruitment, HR, business partner, all, all of the stuff that is needed in HR. And then I, I kind of drifted away into sales and then uh, I started sourcing at sourcing uh, with Western Union. Um, it was uh, my last year in Lithuania. It was me and my colleague. We were the first two people in the organization as a test sourcing function. We were basically an experiment in the in, in the company to see uh, whether we could be as a internal agency because the company was spending too much on agencies and we wanted to to leverage that out. So my colleague was looking after the French speaking countries and I was originally they were looking for a German speaker. Sadly, I don't speak German and uh, I ended up uh, sourcing salespeople face to face, door door to door kind of salespeople in Austria, Germany, Nordics. UK and Ireland. Not speaking German and supporting recruiters in Austria was interesting. Scandinavia, you know, was a, a very different market as well because, you know, Scandinavia is more like a, it's not a receiving, like money receiving market, right? They, they would be, they don't really use that kind of service in general. The, the market was not really good for the company to begin with. So I was looking for the first people in, in those, you know, locations to actually start being those first business development managers, you know, to, to, to start the whole thing. To make things even more interesting, there was no budget for anything uh, as it happens normally. And I've heard quite a few people, you know, share their stories about that, that you just, you know, you have nothing and you have to be creative. Of course, we had LinkedIn, corporate account, um, and we had Read in, in, and the Monster, mm -hmm. but most like a limited edition for certain countries. And I think just for, advertising um, what me and my colleague we were like super close as a, as a function we were doing very different things but we were we were two, two in one right uh, and uh, so we dived straight away into looking how uh, you know how our job descriptions look analyzing it to make it more unified across the, the EMEA region uh, to uh, experiment with our approaches that we're using you can only see if you're successful or not if you're tracking uh, your process and see what's working like whether what that was an email or an email or you know all of that but now you know, when I look back it's the stuff that we were doing it I wouldn't even con consider sourcing uh, because we were so limited like we didn't even have Google Chrome not even mentioning extensions like we were on the Internet Explorer and maybe in the last few last months I, I got the approval of IT to actually have Google Chrome because of the security and all of that. Depending on the market, we would go talk with universities and we would get feedback from the market and we would talk to the business and say like, you know, maybe we need to adjust the title. You won't find someone with five years of experience because this is not the job that anyone wants to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. So we need to find maybe more junior people. We were uh, talking to um, unemployment companies, agencies, and you know, and all of that. So it was a very challenging thing. And then because of the restructuring, I lost my Austrian uh, recruiters. Uh, so I had more time on my hands. I dived more into 
admin stuff with Taleo, merging candidates, trying to find people. And I think that in general, the biggest mistake that we in the recruitment do is we ignore people that already showed interest in the company to begin with. However, because typically companies don't invest a lot of money into having a good ATS, but talent pooling is a very different thing, right? So yeah, so I was kind of all over the place, uh, but that was my first step into sourcing. And I guess uh, the, the biggest inspiration back then was uh, I, I started doing my research and trying to learn uh, online what's happening. And I remember the first thing that I found was social talent and Johnny. Uh, and, and I started like, at that time, they were doing the weekly webinars of 30 minutes. I you think they didn't can, even have still that. get them all on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was kind of the original uh, development way for me. You know, like the original, that was the way for me to actually get information that is coming not from, you know, Lithuania, because in Lithuania, there was no sourcing. Mm. Like, I, I haven't seen anyone who would be doing sourcing. I mean, of course, there were people who would be looking at hunting, but maybe that was more considered of an agency thing rather than internal thing. Because yeah, all companies, they were more like basically looking for applications. Yeah. So waiting for them to, to show up. Then I was offered to, to relocate to UK to continue to work with Western Union, but business solution side of, of the company. And uh, I became a coordinator. Uh, so I was managing all the uh, all the process, you know, with, with everyone, managers, candidates, HR, recruiters, everyone. It kind of gave me a lot of space in creating more outside of the job description and doing more things that, that could benefit, that the team could benefit. So I started doing training on Taleo, tips and tricks on a weekly basis. If you know how to use the system right, yeah. you, it will save you time. And if you leave no comments about the candidate that you spoke to, it will save my time finding the candidates, you know, and on all of that. So after that, I went traveling. I did some backpacking in Asia. And when I came back, I kind of started everything from scratch. It took me some time to understand what do I like to clear out my head and to understand what I want to do. I kind of settled in London and then I started looking for a job. And uh, uh, the irony was that I went through one uh, recruitment agency. They introduced me to uh, a company and they were looking for a recruitment coordinator. For, with Taleo, everything was like, it was a perfect role for me. Like, and the manager was really cool. And he was like, you know, I think that you need to work for the agency. I was like, well, why? It's like, I think you should be good at that, but I'm applying for your job. You know? But well, one thing led to another and he gave feedback to the, the agency that I was working with. And, and then a few weeks later, they're like, hey, you know, we're looking for a sourcer. Would you like to join us? You know, and that's how I ended up with Aspen in-house. And I think that was the, that was actually the best thing that happened out of everything that was, that was the best thing that could have happened in, in, in that moment in time and in that under those circumstances as well, because on my first week, I was sent to Sourcing Summit. My second day was Sourcing Summit in Amsterdam. And I was like, okay, and I was alone. And I was like, wait, what, what is happening? Like, you know, what, what, wait, wait, I've just started a job. And you know, and you're meeting people and, uh, and they're like, hey, so what are you doing? I was like, I think I'm sourcing sorcerers. <laughs> And then I was like, wait, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> They're like, that's like Matrix and Inception at the same time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and everyone was like, good luck. <laughs> and now I know what they meant. <laughs> Obviously, like you had a lot of insights from very much from the, the kind of UK companies where they think they're looking for in a sourcer. Is there a lot of kind of difference between what people are looking for in a sourcer or even a recruiter who sources? And in the kind of UK role that you were working on with, with Aspen? First of all, you know, we were the, uh, one of the few companies in the UK who was trying to help agency people move in-house. Mm -hmm. so that's like a crazy, crazy move to do to begin with. Like, it's a very, you have to be very dedicated when you make a decision to do that, right? So we were not just an agency. Uh, like agencies even, using the word agency when it comes to Aspen is a bit of an insult because it was consultancy and it was... I, I saw that we were doing a lot of pro bono work, you know, we would be talking to absolutely everyone who would send their CV our way. Normally companies don't waste time. Out of that, you build a relationship, you build a, you know, you share the feedback about the market. Are you, uh, I would give advice on, re on CVs, you know, like 
when, when I think about it, like I was, I was giving feedback recruiters how their CV should look like. How crazy that is, you know, it's like... We should know yeah. how, yeah. I think that when it comes to sourcers, like, so we were, we were uh, mainly, uh, our clients were like tech companies, like Facebook, Amazon, uh, Rackspace, Improbable, uh, World, uh, World Remit, FinTech, cool startups, and like, you know, well-established businesses, Apple. So when we would already have the job to work on, it would be extremely niche skill set that is needed, right? Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have too many companies which you can choose from because as an example, you know, when you look at Facebook, they have their own sourcing team. They have quite a few companies doing the same thing and, you know, to compete in the market and how many people already spoken with the company when you think about it, to find someone who have never spoken to them, it's pretty crazy. So I think that in general, when it comes to sorcerers and recruiters, for me, when I would be talking to them after approaching them, uh, for me, it would be very un important to understand the motivation in general, not what you did and what you want to do, but who you are as a person, because it's, it would you know now more and more companies are choosing about the team fit, you know, cultural fit and, and those things that you will never see in the CV. So it's just something that you can only see from the conversation. When we were doing work remotely, like I've never met, I think I've maybe met one or two people that I was kind of talking to. It was always done through a, uh, just through a phone and an email, you know, but we had the trust with the companies and we had the trust with people that we spoke with, but it's enough, you know, we don't need to go into the meetings, you know, well, Andy, who was the owner of the company, he was more dealing with the client side. I was kind of doing my part of the job and sourcing and finding people and so on. Originally, I was like a six month contract. I ended up staying for 15 months. And uh, for me, the biggest challenge was that I didn't feel that I'm uh, giving back enough Mm -hmm. Because I knew that there was a lot of investment in me. And uh, uh, during my interview, I was asked, like, you know, is there any tool that you would like to have or you wanted to, to have? And going back into, mem you know, that Western Union days, I was like, social talent, social talent, social talent, you know, it's like echoing. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, I always wanted to do social talent training. And part of the offer was what I actually had a chance to do the Black Ninja uh, training. I, I guess Sourcing Summit completely transformed my um, mindset because up until that moment, I saw sourcing as a sourcer, is a junior recruiter who wants to be a recruiter, but is not there yet. So yeah, here are some roles. You will not talk to people, but just find them. In, so in Amsterdam, I saw a bunch of people who they're proud to be sourcers and they don't want to be recruiters. Yeah. And I was like, I never considered that as, as a, uh, an equal part in the recruitment process. So, and then I've met Catherine Robinson. Uh, ironically, now she's my colleague. And, uh, you know, and we met after one of the Catherine's, uh, uh, it was like uh, meetups. One of the meetups, exactly, at uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and when you think about it, like one thing leads to another. And I mean, I, if I wouldn't go to that meetup, yeah, we would meet at some point, but <laughs> that was a very good timing and a very good uh, environment. And, uh, you know, and for me now, it just blows my mind when I think about it, like rewinding time. I think it was like one and a half years ago, something like that, right? Something like that. Yeah, there were like, what, 15 people who came to the meetup? And then there was Ralph from LinkedIn. Ralph uh, Hong. Uh, Catherine. And yeah. two of them, we ended up in a pub. And now when I think about it, I was in a, in a pub like a, a nobody, you know, compared <laughs> when you think about it, right? Like, and you guys were rock stars <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a sourcing community, right? And for me, being that close and having the possibility to, you know, kind of reach out and like, hey, you know, I'm stuck with this or what, what do I do? And, you know, when you have people who honestly care, that's the, the, the most important feature, you know, sharing, right? So coming back to your question, I think that sourcers, can only be successful if they are uh, passionate and creative and curious. In my recent job interview, uh, I was asked, what do you like the least about being a sorcerer? And that's a brilliant question, right? <laughs> and me being me, I was like, well, what I like the least is that you have days when you feel like you're banging your head into a wall and it feels that you're 
brain is bleeding. You know, and the recruiter looked at me, is like, okay, so what do you like about your job then? I was like, well, you have other days when you find people. <laughs> and that's part of the job. You can't have every single day positive. You won't have every single day that everything is working. And I remember even when we were, two of us, we were uh, sourcing for air source uh, charity thing. I, I, I realized how much pressure I was putting on myself that, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not, you know, I didn't have enough candidates or something like that. But I never was in a pressure, pressured environment. And Andy Mountney was an incredible mentor to have and a, a, like incredible manager. And the amount of trust, he, you know, we would meet like once or twice a week, you know, and he would be like, hey, these are your roles. I trust you. You know what you got to do. I'm not tracking your time. And it was purely up to me, you know, I would have days when I would be like nowhere, like seriously dead, dead end, you know. And then 11 at night, I was like, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And you're like, you can't wait to go into work and just test things. I'm so emotional talking about these things because it's, it just, maybe it, another thing is that, you know, now I'm in a, in a, mentally I'm in a good place, right? But you know really well that it wasn't the case like about a few months ago. So sometimes it's extremely hard to look back and to evaluate whether the decisions that we make are good or not and sometimes we might end up in a trap in a mental trap basically like my contract ended with andy actually exactly today a year ago uh it was 14th of november uh, december that was my last day and then i, I kind of did freelancing with a music uh, startup uh, until may and then i was just traveling so from january i was like traveling and working remotely and then when I came back, I was like, okay, I need to do something. My gut feeling was telling me that you shouldn't be staying in India. You need to go back to Europe. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to go back. You know, I want to, I still want to travel, you know. I ended up, you know, I ended up in uh, returning for my mom's uh, anniversary, going back home. And um, because it was a very last minute thing, of course, it cost a fortune, you know. And then, you know, when you ran out of money, you need to find a job in a way, right? And then I, I was like, okay, so what to do next. And I think that I'm more like a nomad. I mean, if someone would ask me, where's my home? I could tell five locations that I would call my home, right? So I was like, okay, so London is one of the places. And now with Brexit and everything, it's, it's not really, no one knows, right? So I was considering options to go to Tallinn. Uh, like I was going, interviewing with one company. I was really in the process of like, oh, wow, maybe I should go to Estonia. It was like, it's even smaller than Lithuania. <laughs> that would be really boring. And then there was, you no, know, I was going through interviews, but this time I was like really focused on, I want to be in-house. I want to be very good brand because the tricky part with me was that typically people start with agency and then they try to go in-house. Yeah. I started in-house. And then you went to agency. And then I went through agency and then I did freelancing. So <laughs> I had such a very mixed bag. And, and on the other hand, I didn't have experience in tech sourcing. Mm -hmm. Every sourcer needs to have tech sourcing, you know, so it's a bit of a crazy combination to have, right? You know, and I was interviewing with some companies and uh, really cool brands. And then there was one company that like sold themselves to me. I believed in their idea. The problem was that they were consultancy, even though it, it, it cool consultancy, but it wasn't in-house, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, and the irony of the whole thing was that I came to London the same day for the meetup. Uh, source meet meetup that was held in Deliveroo and I remember we had a chat and I had a chat with other people and I was raising questions you know as you always do when uh, Katrina I remember I was asking something about WhatsApp is pe are people using WhatsApp for sourcing and um, and then people came to me like hey you know what do you do like where do you work and I was like well, <laughs> a job. and you know that's the best environment to get a job you know go to meetups where you know your fellow fellow sourcers or recruiters are you know and there were like five six companies who were like hey we need to talk to you it was like well fine uh, you know i'd love to talk and then on monday they started pinging me messages on linkedin and the next day i had like the final stage with that company and on monday i got the offer and i got the ear infection at the same time and, uh, and i paused everything i said like look guys you know i'm really grateful about interest you know but i can't start the process because i accepted the offer <laughs> and six weeks later my first permanent contract in 10 years ended the same day it was another meetup the same of facebook <laughs> and i went and i was dreading because like the experience that i had was so different in a way that i felt pretty quickly that it's not the right place for me yeah 
but I couldn't admit the failure of making the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was dreading going to work. I had anxiety attacks. I was, I couldn't sleep. I, I knew that I'm failing and I knew that I, my brain is shutting down. And the worst part in that was when I actually started doubting if I can, if I'm a sorcerer, mm -hmm. if I want to do this, if I ever did it in the right way, or it, if it's for me, you know, it was so, such a bad state to be in. And, um, and I remember like, when my manager told me, hey, you know, things are not working out and all of this. For me, the biggest, because I already knew that I, I would have that challenging conversation in the morning, but in the evening I was working on a technical role that I was really struggling with because I hadn't done tech. You know, I was trying to find different approach and all of that. And I found a, you know, and I found a meetup, meetup community with 1,500 professionals what, of what I need, right? And I sent to my managers like, hey, look, can you check if our client would finance the meetup? Because we would target people directly. These are the, the people that we need. Yeah. No answer. That was Monday. No answer. <laughs> like, okay. And I was like, and I was de demotivated because I got in touch with the organizer of the meetup. He's like, hey, dude, your company is so awesome, you know. And I was a bloody brilliant tech startup in London, you know. And, uh, and there was nothing. Silent. I was like, mm, okay. And then on Wednesday, my motivation was like super low because I thought that I did something different and creative. And I was like, it doesn't seem that it's needed. Then on Wednesday, I started like x-raying blogs and, and trying to find people who are, have the same languages and sending messages on their private emails and, and all of that. And then in the next day, that was Thursday, I, I, I came to my, man, you know, I walked into the office and I was like, hey, you know, I know I've been shit with this role, but I finally have 40 people. I approached them, you know, two are interested. No, he looked at me and he was like, you should have done it two weeks ago. For me, that was what? <laughs> Six weeks in the job. It, it took me a while. I didn't work all the time on that role, you know, but that's not the motivation, you know, yeah. because I, I know Andy, the, the stuff that I've learned from him is just, first of all, being transparent and authentic and, and yourself and stay the way it is. You know, and when that conversation started, I was gone. And then in the evening, I met you guys and instead of networking with other people, I started talking to people that I already knew or that I've met in, in the meetup before. And I, sh I shared my situation mm -hmm. because I needed guidance in understanding if I'm crazy yeah. or really things are going wrong. And they just told me, look, really not the place for a sorcerer. And for me, that was just a green light. And the next day I resigned. And then I, I took some time um, to just clear my brain. Clear your head, yeah. And you know, and because of you, you advised me to, to volunteer at Sourcing Summit. I went there, it was bloody awesome. Like, you know, that week, I already kind of met some, some of the cool and rock star sorcerers before, but I always say, you know, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. It's mm -hmm. around, you know. I, I'm not the person who would be taking selfies with, with musicians or with sorcerers or whatever. I don't need that, right? For me, it's more about having that private conversation that no yeah. one knows about or like connecting on another level rather than tweeting, oh my God, I just met Mark, you know, <laughs> thanks for the connection, Mark. I would do that privately. I don't need everyone to scream to everyone, right? So that week like was just madness. But when I went there, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to finance my week. My money was running out. I was like, what I'm going to do next? I had no idea, no plan. I was like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine, you know. Like for me, the, the craziest thing was when, you know, we were preparing for the, for the conference and on the day, I think it was Monday evening, and Irina was, you know, in, in our room, like we were preparing the, the tags and everything, and Irina walks in, and she's like a legend, like, you know. I mean, she's one of the OGs, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and she walks in, and she's like, hey guys, how can I help? And I think Gordon or, or Kim, they're like, well, we have tags. And she started doing tags, and I was like, I was like, wow. When, when you think about it, like, all of them, they're at the level where they can say like, you look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm this, right? <laughs> but it's not about that, it's a community thing, yeah. you know, when you're helping one another, and I think, what really amazes me what you're doing, you know, with this show as well, because as you said as well, like everyone has a story and everyone, every story can inspire someone else. And I think I didn't see that way, you know, when we spoke a few months ago about this, 
because I, I felt that I'm not, I remember like looking four or five months back, I was like, if Mark started doing the show, I hope one day I would be good enough to actually be on the show. And then like two days later, hey, dude, you want to come on my show? And I was like, have you seen who you interview? Because for me, you know, the way my brain works is, you know, you're, I'm, I'm comparing myself with the best in what they do, right? So, of course, you know, if I'm doing it for like two, three years, I can't be equal to someone who's doing it for 10 or 15 years, right? But you can still learn a lot of things and you can experiment. No, and you do things differently. And it's like this, like, I'm learning from you. I mean, we had a conversation today as well where you're like, have you looked at this thing? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's... It's one of those things It's like, I should really do look more at that. Why am I not? Some of the best sourcers have not been in sourcing for a very long time because they don't see things like they're supposed to. Okay. They just question it and they're like, why are we doing it like that? That doesn't make any sense. And you're like, you're absolutely right. I don't know. So, and that's like, I spent the last couple of years really starting to question this. Why are we doing it this way? Like, is that because people tell, say that we have to, or is there... Is there an actual reason or can we do it differently? And, and you know, I think that maybe the, the most important thing of like to be successful as a sorcerer is to have freedom, to have creative freedom, you know, to not that, oh, you know, I'll work from anywhere in the world, but which would be awesome, but, but um, to have freedom where you can experiment and where you, you know, where you have the possibility to take the time and to, to look into the, you know, into what you're, you know, what you're doing. After Sourcing Summit, you know, I, like, even before that, I started, like, interviewing with only, I had only two interviews with two companies. And both of those companies were from the meetup, from SourceCon meetup, out of those four people that I opened up to. You also knew that was companies that had sourcers and that was open to sourcers. Biggest fear was when, you know, when I resigned from the company, uh, that I complete up my CV or I completely, you know, destroyed my reputation or anything because it's a special conversation, you know, it's an, another topic. I have a lot of things to share about what could be maybe red, potentially red flags for a sorcerer, mm -hmm. you know, in an in a environment or in, in a job, what to look out and to avoid. And, and if you see any of that, just run because it's, you know, it's a matter of time, but it's going to backfire anyway, because I think that the most important thing for any team or any business, if you were looking for a sourcer, is to, to make sure that the sourcers ha are equal to recruiters. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not assistants. They're not coordinators. You know, really good sourcers, they know the market. Recruiters, you know, are dealing with the incoming stuff. I'm, I'm glad where more and more recruiters are sourcing themselves because it's it's a skill that is needed uh, because talents, they don't really apply. I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious. And for me, you know, when, when I started going for those interviews, like I was, I was crazy in a way that when I look back, I was so transparently open and I was underselling myself mm -hmm. because I was applying, like I was talking to two big tech companies and saying like, look, I've never touched tech before. I mean, I did for like a month in that place that didn't work out. But even in that month, I looked into AngelList, Stack Overflow, GitHub, Amazing Hiring. I listed out things and there was one situation that completely, you said like, hey, you know that there are certain things that you know that most of people don't know. And I was like, look, no, I'm sure that everyone knows those things. And there was this funny thing where I was asked a question by a tech recruiter uh, who's been doing tech for like, what, five, six years. She's like, oh, okay, so for example, if you find a GitHub uh, profile, like, how would you approach a person? And I was like, well, that's simple. You know, if, if, if we're talking about GitHub, well, 30% of people will have it on their profile anyway, visible. All the others, they don't, but you, you use a special URL, you change the code into their username, and you have their, uh, their, their email. Or if I use another URL, I would get information whether they want to be contacted or not. She looked at me and I looked and said like, well, that's kind of obvious. And she looked at me and she's like, this is the first time that I hear that. <laughs> How do you approach them? And I'm now, now looking back, I don't remember the answer though. So, but, but you know, that was funny. And um, because th that was the moment when I realized, you know, that, oh my God, you know, maybe I do know more than I, than I think that I do because yeah. you know, we take a lot of things for granted. And it's just like it, you absorb and you kind of forget and it just stays. But if you need, 
you kind of try to play it around, you know. And I guess another thing that was really good challenge for me that gave me the confidence back, not only was meeting all the incredible people at Sourcing Summit where I was looking after the speakers and uh, spending a lot of time with them. And uh, everyone's like, hey, you know, dude, I'm going to help you finding the job. And I'm, you know, what you're looking for. And there were a lot of companies who came to me and from like, Berlin and Amsterdam. And I was like, look, you know, I don't want to move from London as of now, uh, but I'm happy to connect and stuff like that. But oh yeah, there was a hackathon, right? Which is a a typical thing. I mean, the first time when I went there, uh, I sadly missed out on it. So I didn't know what it it is. And for me, the biggest frustration was that uh, we were all in that big hole uh, everyone with a laptop. And uh, basically there are so many incredible people in in one place like so many bright minds in one place you know how can you actually like there's it's not even a question of competition because there's no competition (laughs) like you know that they're gonna be better anyway like you know that's the assumption that you make and i had like really trouble with logging in because system wasn't working there were some faulty questions and all of that and then when the whole thing was over and they showed the list of people i was 13th out of 130 that was like that was eye-opening because I wasn't doing it for the win. Because when mm-hmm. you, you know, when you when you log in after 25 minutes, you know, <laughs> right? Like there's there's just it's not gonna happen. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna do it. But the irony was, but I don't know how they counted those those points and everything. But basically, from number nine until number 16 were people in the same amount of points. But the irony was that I was I was the one who had done the same amount of points in less amount of time (laughs) which is crazy right i mean it's you know that for me was like coming back like a month before when i was like am i good enough i'm good enough but i can be better this is what completely put my mind at ease and that that was the moment when i said no to one company and then actually another company wanted to talk to me and i was like very clear you know of what i don't want because i didn't want to go into high volume environment because i i I was never exposed to that yeah i was going to quality and approaching less amount of people because you know for me imagine that's a madness in in that six-week job i was asked to okay you have a senior technical manager for a tech company uh and i want by the end of the day i want to you to put 100 people in the uh, in the linkedin project and uh go i was working with the best tech companies there are not that many companies to choose from to begin with if we're talking about that high level and what my manager forgot to tell me was that there was already a project of 150 people and the best people that i knew they were already approached (laughs) you know you have to share information right so or like i give you an hour and i want 50 people for this role and you have to message them and i would be like that's spam For me, in everything that I did when it came to sourcing, I always tried to put the quality stamp on it to make it personal. Yes, I'm using certain templates, uh, how to structure the message and all of that, but that it would not be robotic. You can't make 50 messages and 50 profiles in an hour because I don't want to ruin the quality of the person who would come back to me. Yeah, I'm interested. And I would look into their profile and I'm like, well, you're not really there quality-wise. And, you know, I can't do that. So I choose a wider scope and kind of longer way of doing things, but making sure that I'm doing it properly. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, like, I'm putting my name on the line as well. I, I didn't feel comfortable spamming people anymore. If someone reports you, like, anywhere in the groups, of, hey, this guy is spammer, you're done. This is, you know, this is how I ended up in Expedia. And uh, you, you've seen me through quite, quite a few stages in my life, right? So, I mean, I've, I haven't had that, you know, in a long time, first of all, when I'm in the office and with a team, right? So uh, I was working for the last two years. I was mainly working remotely and, and freelancing and stuff like that. So it's such an incredible feeling to be back into belonging to a team. And when you know that you are a group of people who work on things together yeah. and we are four sourcers who are working in four different teams so it's like a team inside of a team it's a new function as well and we can uh, build a lot of stuff uh, experiment play with new tools try to see what works and uh, and you know and i'm just glad to to be part of the team that is supportive and i, d- I didn't have tech 
right? And I was asking in general, why me? Like I didn't have tech, like I'm, and because I, I said like, if you need someone to deliver candidates at the end of the day, someone who comes even from agency with a tech background, tech hiring, they, they could easily do that better, quicker, because for me, it will take time to pick it up. I, I'd say that for me, the hardest thing was to really make sure that I'm making the right decision this time. Mm -hmm. Because if I would have made the wrong, like the decision that wouldn't work this time, I'm not sure if I would be able to recover, you know, mentally. Yeah. Because then would be like, look, you're, you, you don't make judgment in the right way. <laughs> it's not for me. Now, I'm, I'm just super happy. Like Monday morning, I'm like going to work with a smile on my face. Mm. My flatmates, they're like, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm happy. It doesn't matter because it's just, I learn a lot. I have a lot of time to learn and to to try and to experiment. I have time to, to do things differently. And that's incredible because, you know, meetups is, for example, another thing is meetups, you know, right? So we had a SourceCon meetup. And for me, that's the, that's the, the biggest irony in the world. So you, you guys had four meetups. I went to three. With the first one, I came to London. I was looking for a job. In the second one, I was um, basically fired from the job and trying to recover and to look for a job. And then in another meeting, I was basically hosting a meetup. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's just, you know, it's just the irony. And this is the universe is smiling and saying, look, that was the perfect timing. You know, everything is kind of blended in together because you started talking to Expedia about the meetup, you know, before I even were anywhere near that, right? So it's just like, it wasn't, none, none of that was planned, right? But it's like... Kind of, what are some of the things that you use to learn the, the kind of technical aspects? Thing number one that helped me was uh, Jan's book, mm -hmm. uh, Full Stack Recruiter. I, I read it and I made, you know, I even copied Boolean strings into my Trello boards, <laughs> like, and all of that. My whole life is now in Trello, personal and work, because it's, it's super cool and easy to actually just vomit everything that you find about the market, about companies, about keywords, whatever that is, and then just drag things around. Yeah, Jan's book, definitely. Um, in general, I, I'm really learning when I'm talking to candidates and I'm saying, look, look, it's my first month, it's my second month, I'm new to data science, I'm new to analytics, teach me, tell me. So now I already understand more and more and uh, I went to Our Ladies event, uh, I went to Women, uh, women and data. I, I'm just incredibly surprised to see. I mean, for me, the biggest shock is to see so many, so many people who are passionate about data. Just like we are passionate about sourcing, <laughs> there are people who are passionate about data. And I'm like, it's incredible. It's like, it's, uh, and especially a lot of women, you know, uh, as well. For, for our company, it's extremely important to have the balance in, in, in anything and uh, to support, you know, especially women, to support women in going into tech. And, uh, and ironically enough, uh, one of the speakers at the event that we did with our ladies, uh, London meetup, uh, she said very similar thing, what for me is always kind of resonates where you're not there yet, you just started and you're doubting yourself, just do it, just put it online, just, just do it and the community will help you. It's the same thing all over the, in, in any community, you just be part of the community because that will make you stronger. Yes, at the beginning, maybe you will be selfish and you will be taking knowledge, but then you will reach the moment when you will be sharing knowledge, just like that. Like for today, my colleague came to me and was like, hey, you know, like um, there's this tool, Bonbon, bon, you know, a video messaging, like what do you think of it? I was like, actually, I was like, well, you should talk to Mark about it because like he was the first basically sorcerer who, who tested it. And I don't even remember that was like April last year or yeah, something. That's when we did the air source things. Like, yeah, I was showing you there. Yeah. So that was April, May, you know, and I was like, and I tested it as well. And for me, you know, it was crazy. Like it's, it's, you know, you, you need to test it to know whether that's for you or not for you. What my goal is right now is just to, um, to look into communities and uh, try to identify influential people in those communities, reach out to them. Uh, make a contact and another thing is to kind of uh, to put my coding skills to the test as well and maybe look into coding a bit uh, because now I have a unique opportunity to finally after a really long time to focus on one area and you know look to look into data science and analytics of course you know connecting with other uh, sourcers recruiters going to meetups and, and events and you know there are you know 
London is lucky to have a lot of those events. Like yeah. for me, uh, the ones that I at least went once or twice, uh, every time Social Talent is doing something, I'm there. Uh, HR Disrupt is trickier because it's, it's not a free event. Uh, so I might not always be able to go. Um, SourceCon, True, uh, AirSource, you know, there are uh, different, uh, different communities. But, you know, if, if someone is listening to this and they don't know any of those, I would highly recommend to check it out. And, you know, just like with SourceCon, you have those meetups in all over the world now. So, you know, if you don't have any, maybe you can reach out to Mark and say, hey, I want to do this in this or that country. I mean, or this or that region, right? So, um, and in general, just saying hi to people that you like, that you follow and connecting with them. Like I've connected to quite a few people after hearing them on your show and I just, you know, shared my feedback or my opinion about what they shared, you know, and it's, you know, and it's really cool because at the end of the day, we're not competition. We're, you know, we're, if we are able to bring the quality of sourcing to another level, you know, it, that's what matters, you know, because we, are not spamming people. We are trying to help them to find something better, you know, but uh, we're not being too salesy because if someone is like really happy, why would you bother them? Why would you try to change their mind, right? So just leave them. And Dov, uh, if uh, people want to stay in contact with you, um, how do they best reach you? So I think that the, the, the place where you can find me for sure is like, uh, in the easiest, um, uh, then I'm pretty rubbish at Twitter, but this is something that I, I have a goal and uh, plan for next year to actually start doing. Check out my blog. Uh, uh, I think you can put all those links in, into the description or something like that. Um, and yeah, and one of the things that I'm planning to, uh, that is a goal for myself for next year, is to actually combine indie music and sourcing and, and share the indie sourcing playlist uh, with the sourcing community. So yeah reach out to me and yeah, feel free to say hi on any platform that you are using. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for your time, Doug. Thank you, it's been a pleasure, man.